Well, good evening, uh, fellow students of Scripture. We are uh, broadcasting each day this week, talking, studying the most important week in the history of the world. And so this being Tuesday, we're looking at the events of Tuesday this evening. Um, this is one of the days where we have a lot of information in Scripture. There's quite a few chapters devoted to Tuesday, uh, so we're going to be looking at them in sort of a summary approach, uh, but it might take a little bit longer than the one we did on Monday and then the, uh, the Wednesday broadcast. Uh, we don't have hardly anything about Wednesday, so that'll be interesting uh, to reflect on what little we do have. But uh, Tuesday is a very important day, and just sort of a, as, as a quick outline, um, <clears throat> remember that on Monday, one of the things the Lord did was he cursed a fig tree as sort of an acted out parable. He found a fig tree that didn't have any fruit on it, no figs, and he said, may you never bear figs again. And um, it's actually on Tuesday that uh, the disciples see the result of that. So that happens right at the beginning of this day as they come back into the city. And then um, much of the day is spent up in the temple with uh, debates and questions with the religious leaders and the authorities. Uh, quite a bit of interaction, dialogue uh, between Jesus and, and those who are really wanting to kill him. And then the day ends uh, with them leaving the city, once again going out to Bethany, but on the way, and Jesus sits down on the Mount of Olives across the valley from Jerusalem and has this great discussion, uh, which is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, the uh, speech on the Mount of Olives, which talks about the end of Jerusalem and also the end of the world. And so that closes the day uh, before they go back to their nightly place in, in Bethany. So again, it starts out coming into the city on Tuesday morning, we assume. Um, the disciples see that this fig tree that Jesus had cursed the previous day has withered, has died. They're sort of amazed as they remember that he had done that. And they say, look, Lord, what happened? And... Um, Jesus makes sort of an enigmatic statement, I guess you'd say, uh, uh, where he, he uses it. Remember the original purpose of the parable, the acted out parable, was to say, here's a, a fruit tree, a fig tree that is not bearing fruit. And then he was going to go up into the temple, which was supposed to be a place of prayer. That was, that was to be the fruit of the temple. And he didn't see prayer. Instead, he saw business being conducted and actually dishonest business. That's what really made him angry, and he cleansed the temple. Um, but uh, when they see the withered fig, fig tree the next day, you can read about this in Matthew 21 and in Mark 11, he makes a different point. Uh, he's always constantly trying to teach the Twelve. Uh, and his point there is, the, the power of prayer and the ability to do great things. He says, you think this is amazing that, that I could make this fig tree wither? You can do much greater things through faith. Uh, you can tell this mountain to be removed and cast into the heart of the sea. Um, so I uh, won't spend um, any more time talking about that or, or applying it, but it's just amazing, no matter uh, what's going on, he's trying to teach them something. And even here, in the last days of his life, the days before the cross, he's, he's, he's trying to teach them and train them for, for future things. So then uh, Jesus goes up into the temple here on Tuesday morning. Um, you know, if you, you reflect back again, the first couple of days, uh, the events have, have really shown how popular Jesus is, what a following he has. Um, and this has alarmed, once again, the religious leaders. They're very concerned. They, they're going to try and do something about it. 
um, try and find some way to accuse Jesus or turn the crowds against him, whatever they can do. Um, and uh, after he had cleansed the temple, after he had kicked out the, those who were ripping everybody else off, um, the next day the, the leaders come to him, this is recorded in Mark chapter 11, and say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right to come into our temple and direct traffic, redirect traffic? Um, and Jesus answers their question with another question, which was one of his techniques, um, showing his incredible wisdom. His question has to do with John the Baptist, who was very popular amongst uh, the common folk, just like Jesus was. Um, and his question is, uh, basically, did John and what he said, did that come from God, or was it just something he made up? Was it from man? And um, it really stumps the leaders. They sort of huddle and say, you know, if we say that that John's message came from God, which they didn't believe, but if we say it came from God, uh, then he's going to say, then, you know, why didn't you follow him? Can't do that. But if we say that his teaching was from man, the crowds are going to be ticked off at us. We can't say that. And so when they refuse to answer, Jesus says, okay, what's fair is fair. I'm not going to answer your question either, where I get my authority. Of course, he knew where he got his authority, but they didn't really deserve an answer. Well, that sort of a prelude to what the whole day is going to be. It's going to be a day full of questions where the leaders of the temple area and the Jewish religion try to trap Jesus and expose him and maybe draw down his his popularity a bit, maybe even find a reason to have him arrested. And so there's going to be a series of three or so questions. Um, this is a day of questions um, that are directed at Jesus. And most of them are asked by uh, his opponents. And um, an interesting thing, after this day is over, this day of questions where they're really uh, going at one another and interacting with one another, um, there's not going to be any more, after this, any more discussion between Jesus and his enemies the rest of the week. Um, they don't have anything more to say to each other. They're at an impasse. And uh, so this is the day when they're face to face. The first question that's asked comes from a group that were known as the Herodians. They were um, devotees of Herod, the king. Uh, Herod was... In, that, in essence, a Jewish king, but he was really royal to the Romans. The Romans had set him up as, as leader of Judea. And these were Jews who were loyal to him. They're going to um, be a part of this question, but then a very unlikely other party joins them, the Pharisees. The Pharisees, in contrast, the Herodians are sort of the religious right wing of the Jews. They're the, the Bible believers. Um, and they wouldn't have been allies normally of the Herodians. In fact, quite the opposite. And yet it says they come together and work together on this occasion. They have a common enemy. Uh, and that enemy, of course, is Jesus. And so um, both all of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, record this particular question. They come to Jesus and they say, Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Um, in fact, uh, they sort of flatter Jesus um, at the beginning of, of their question to him. Just, just recalling here the way they do it in Matthew chapter 22. Um, Matthew says, uh, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, and, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. They're sort of buttering him up, flattering him. 
because they really don't feel that way about him. And then they ask the question, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? They really don't care his opinion on this, but they think it's a trap. So if he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, then they can turn to the Romans and say, look, you ought to arrest this guy because uh, he's saying don't pay taxes to the government. Um, although, if he, if he did say that, his popularity would soar with the common people because that's the way they felt. If Jesus, on the other hand, says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, then the regular folks are going to be disenchanted with him. So either way he answers, his enemies think they've got him. And uh, so his, the way he responds is ingenious and again reveals his great, his great wisdom. Jesus says in verse uh, 18, uh, and it's very interesting how Matthew, in, or in Matthew chapter 22, how he couches it. He says, but Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Who put, uh, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. That famous line that you've probably heard before. You know, that, that that's an incredibly wise and um, confounding answer to the enemies. You know, the picture on that coin would have been of the emperor of Rome, uh, Tiberius Caesar the son of Augustus, the one who was alive at the time of Jesus' birth. And if you think about, uh, imagine how long it took the enemies, the Herodians, the Pharisees, to compose this perfect question, this trap, and just how quickly Jesus shatters their plan in the way he answers. Because he doesn't answer yes or no. But he answers with great wisdom and in a way that uh, escapes their malice. That's question number one. Uh, pay taxes or not pay taxes? It's still sort of a trap question, isn't it? And one that troubles us today. Question number two on Tuesday up in the temple area comes from the guys who were really in charge of the temple, the Sadducees. Most of the priests were Sadducees. And um, they were uh, wealthy. Uh, they were the, the richest people in the city of Jerusalem. Um, they're very secular-minded. Um, they're not the religious right wing like the Pharisees. Uh, but they're, they're sort of religious elite and much more liberal in their views of religion. Um, and, for instance, why do we say that? Why, why do we say they're much more liberal? Uh, Sadducees, for instance, don't believe in the resurrection. And they're going to ask a question of, of, about the resurrection here. They don't even believe in it. It sort of reveals their malice. Um, so they ask this question. Uh, it's, it's recorded in Mark chapter 12, um, verses 18 and following. It's a question about... Um, if you remember a person who had been married several times, uh, let's just get the context here, Mark 12, verse 18. Uh, Teacher Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And then here's their hypothetical that they propose. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. Here's their question. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. On the face of it, it's ridiculous. A total hypothetical. Um, they're, they're reflecting on, a, on an Old Testament law that was rarely practiced. It's called the Leverite Law. 
but the way it's proposed here in their question is just something that never happens. It's sort of a ridiculous worst case scenario um, that they're propose proposing as a way to, to trap Jesus, hopefully get him to say the wrong thing. Um, and uh, Jesus explains in his response that uh, in the next life, things are different, uh, including marriage relationships. And so this law of Moses about a brother marrying his, his uh, dead brother's wife um, wouldn't, wouldn't apply any longer. And then he makes the point that, that God is the God who deals with the living, not the dead. Um, and so question number two is foiled by Jesus. Uh, there's more to that, but that's sort of a summary of that second question by the Sadducees, marriage in the resurrection. Then uh, question number three comes from an individual, uh, a, a Pharisee, but it seems less from a group of guys, but, but from an individual. And it's the, the question, which commandment of the law is the greatest? Matthew tells this in chapter 22, and Mark tells it in chapter 12 of his gospel. Um, there's some differences with this particular question. The, the questioner seems a bit more reasonable than the first two groups that came to Jesus. Um, at the end, the Lord seems to be impressed with him, uh, but he has this question that may have been intended uh, to, to trip up the Lord. Um, what's the greatest law? You know, and if Jesus said the wrong thing, they could accuse him of, of not being the great teacher that everybody thought he was. Well, in response, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which was the great text of the Old Testament, the, the golden text of, of the Old Testament, sort of like the John 3.16 uh, for the Jews. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And um, and this this response, Jesus saying, "This is the great law," is uh, is well received by the questioner, and and um, he agrees with Jesus' answer. And at the end of Mark's account in Mark twelve thirty four, Jesus seems impressed with him. So. Don't know the the end of that story. Did he win a convert here, or not? But this, that was the nature of question, big question number three. And then um, after that, uh, Jesus still up in the temple, seems to give a speech. Um, we're not a hundred hundred percent sure what the audience was. Was it just his disciples? Was uh, were any of these questioners, these groups of enemies still around listening? We don't know, but um, probably those who have been trying to trap him and find a way to accuse him have left. Uh, they, they've been shut down and uh, deflated by Jesus' answers. And Jesus takes advantage of that and gives the, the series of woes. He pronounces seven woes against the Pharisees. Not woe as in slow down, but woe as in it's really bad for you. That kind of idea, almost like speaking a curse. Matthew records this in Matthew chapter 23, the seven woes against the Pharisees. And they're very powerful statements. Um, you remember how Jesus expresses them in Matthew 23, just looking at it here. Um, he, he says things like, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Um, you tithe all these things, these small things, and yet you've neglected the greatest important parts of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. He goes on seven times, he pronounces woes 
against the Pharisees. And, and remember that the number seven is very significant when you do something seven times. In, in biblical terms, it's saying uh, you have completely woed them. You know, you, you are really, really in trouble. And that's uh, the end of his, his words up in the temple on Tuesday. Um, and as Jesus begins to leave the city, at the end of, of Matthew 23, he sort of cries out. Um, maybe as he's looking out over the, the temple complex, uh, he had really laid the wood to the Pharisees, and, and, and now he sort of shows a little bit of his tender feeling toward his kinsmen, his fellow Jews, those of Jerusalem. At the end of Matthew 23, uh, remember where he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and yet you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And those are his closing words toward the citizens of Jerusalem um, on Tuesday. Um, very poignant comments by Jesus as he leaves the temple. So the, as as is their habit during this week, Jesus and the disciples leave the city. They walk out, uh, walk up the Mount of Olives on their way to their place that they're staying during the week in Bethany. But before they travel all the way, Jesus sits down on the Mount of Olives and has this amazing lesson, this speech that he gives, as we said earlier, sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, just referring to where it took place on the Mount of Olives. Um, as, as they're walking there, the disciples sort of look back toward Jerusalem and they say to Jesus, how awesome is the temple? That's the Mason translation. Look at these great buildings, these wonderful structures, and it was an incredible building. Um, you, historians of the time said, you've never seen a beautiful building if you haven't seen the Temple of Jerusalem. And the disciples were impressed by it, and as Jews, they were proud of it. And Jesus sort of throws some cold water on that. He says, you see these great buildings? Um, a day is coming where not one stone will be on top of the other, referring to the destru coming destruction of Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, the disciples are like, what are you talking about? Uh, again, we find Jesus saying something that people do not understand. They will in time, but they don't when he says it. Um, the destruction of Jerusalem will occur 35 years, approximately, from the time Jesus prophesies it. Uh, it the city will be totally destroyed. The temple, just like Jesus said, will be uh, reduced to rubble. And he's going to talk about that here in um, Matthew chapter 24. It's also recorded in Mark 13 and in Luke 21, this, this speech that Jesus gives. Uh, again, it occurs on Tuesday after the day full of questions and controversies. And um, Jesus makes the statement that, you know, everything you see here is going to be destroyed. The disciples come to him and they ask him basically three questions. More questions after a day full of questions. They, they ask Jesus, when? When is the temple going to be destroyed? Number two, they ask him, what will be the sign of your coming? And number three, what will be the sign of the end of the age? And... Let me just say about these chapters, Matthew 24, Mark 13, some of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted passages in all the Bible. A lot of the religious confusion in Christianity centers on misunderstanding, misteaching, 
and applying of Jesus's words. And these are, they, they take some work uh, to understand what Jesus is talking about. A lot of people out there will, will lead you astray um, by what they say about what Jesus said. So I'm not saying this is easy, and I'm certainly not going to go through all this in detail in this broadcast. Uh, it's getting late already, but um, this is a, a text to be careful with. The disciples, when they ask Jesus these three questions, when will the temple be destroyed? What sign will um, be a sign of your coming? And what will be a sign of the end of the age? They have to be assuming that all three of those things will happen at the same time because they can't imagine a world without the temple. And so they think all these three things will take place at the same moment. Little did they know that the temple would be destroyed in 35 years, in 70 AD. And little did they know that 2,000 years later, we would still be waiting for the Lord's return. You see, they thought it would all happen at once, and it certainly hasn't all happened at once. So Jesus' statements here in these two chapters in the Gospels uh, really... Um, address their questions, but were something that they probably figured out later, um, not at the moment he said it. And as I said, so much misteaching has been done around this. So in what Jesus says in these chapters, there are times when he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he'll talk about some signs that that's about to happen. Things like the massing of armies and, and seeing them surround Jerusalem and so forth. What he's doing is giving a prophecy, yes, but he's also preparing the believers who will be in Jerusalem in 35 years um, and giving them a warning in advance that when you see these things happen, leave the city because those who stay will not survive. And... History, not scripture, but history tells us that, that the Christian community in Jerusalem left, went to a place called Perea, and, and thus were, were saved from the destruction by the Roman armies. Jesus, in these texts, is giving them warning in advance. Sadly, uh, modern interpreters of this passage have said these are signs of the end of the world, Jesus' second coming. That's a terrible misinterpretation. It has confused people for hundreds of years now. Um, be careful of anybody that can tell that that says they can tell you the signs of the second coming, because Jesus Himself clearly said, "I don't know when it's going to take place. Only the Father knows. Only God the Father." So anything that contradicts Jesus' words there is a problem. So sometimes He's going to be talking about the the end of Jerusalem. In these chapters and sometimes he's going to be talking about his own return at the end of time uh, and when he talks about his own return that is the second coming of Christ towards the end of these chapters specifically uh, Matthew 24 verses 36 through 41 and then Mark 13 verse 32 he says no one knows the timing no one knows when that will occur. A lot of people have tried to tell us and um, fool a lot of people, but Jesus said in the first century, no one knows, only God the Father knows. Uh, so keep that in mind as you, as you interpret Jesus' words. He's giving a warning to first century people about something that was going to happen in the 70th year, 70 A.D., destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies. And then he's also talking a little bit about his second coming. But when he talks about it, he says, no one knows when. His emphasis when he talks about his second coming is, be ready. Be prepared. Because no one knows when it's going to happen. That's what's important. Not so much when, but the fact that, that people are prepared. It'll be a great surprise. 
um, because again, no one knows, but the key is being ready and being prepared and watching for it. That seems to be the emphasis of his teaching. And um, after making those statements, he does what he often does. Jesus tells stories to illustrate or to underline what he's been teaching. So in uh, Matthew 24, um, verses 45 and following, you know, he tells three or four stories about being ready, the importance of being ready. Those are great stories. And um, I'd encourage you to look at those, remind yourself of, of the details of those stories, being ready for the second coming. He also uses some illustrations of what the, the second coming will be like. In Matthew 25, he uses a shepherding metaphor to describe what the final judgment of the world will be like. A shepherd, shepherd separating his sheep uh, and, and his sheep and his goats. And then um, he also talks about um, judgment and what it's based on. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. It seems to be based on um, what people have done rather than what they've said. What they have done or not done. And and that kind of thing uh, in the great judgment scene that he describes. So these are some of the details of, of this important passage. But that all happens um, at the end of Tuesday of the most important week in the history of the world. Jesus is heading home for the night, um, sits down on the Mount of Olives and talks about some of the most important things in the, in, in the universe. Including his second coming. Well, uh, as that day draws to a close, um, there's this interesting passage in chapter 26 of Matthew, right at the beginning, that I just wanted to, to close up with tonight. Um, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, Matthew writes, Chapter 26, verse 1. He said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming. So think we're Tuesday, two days, Wednesday, Thursday. Remember, Passover begins Thursday evening. Jesus says, You know that after two days Passover is coming. That's why they're in the city. At least the disciples think that. And he says, and then the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then it says in verse 3, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest. Different part. I mean, Jesus and the disciples are out on the mountain, across from the city. Back in the city, the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth, and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. These guys, the, the, the religious leaders, Jesus' enemies, they've been, really been trying to kill him for two years, but they've been foiled. He escapes at times, um, different things happen. They still want to kill him. But they've decided after this day in which every attempt they've made has been foiled. Every question they ask has been rebuffed. They decide, we really can't do it this week. We, we cannot do it during Passover. He is so popular with the people. If we try to take him, even if we took him by secret in stealth, they'll find out and they'll wipe us out. Uh, they fear his popularity with the people. So they decide we're not going to do anything more this week. Well, actually, we know that they're, they're, they are going to. What's going to make the change? They've decided on Tuesday we're not going to arrest him. We can't arrest him during Passover. What's going to change that's going to move their plans up? Well, um, 
what's going to change happens on Wednesday. And it's the only thing we know of for sure that, that happens on Wednesday of the most important week in the history of the world. And we'll look at that tomorrow in our broadcast. But something changes their mind and puts them back on schedule to get rid of Jesus on this in this very week. This has been a little bit longer uh, broadcast than the others. I told you there's a lot of material in here, and we really just skimmed through it. But appreciate you being a part of it. Hope it's been a help to you to review these uh, most important events. God bless you tonight.